Good morning. Good to see everybody. Can I have you turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of John chapter 8. If you're new with us, we want to say hi. It's good to see you this morning. And of course, for all our regulars, it's always a blessing to see you guys. Uh, if you're new with us, though, we are working our way through John's Gospel here at Calvary on Sunday morning, going verse by verse. We are currently in chapter 8, but we've paused for a few weeks to do a little series which we entitled True Freedom. Now, it was supposed to end with last week's study, <laughs> but I felt the Lord was telling me to extend it another couple weeks. The study True Freedom came about from our study in John chapter 8, and in particular verse 32, where the Lord Jesus told his disciples that God's truth had the power to set them free from the devil's grip and give them true freedom and victory as children of God. We call this series True Freedom because, as we pointed out, a person will never know true freedom uh, until they become the slave of Christ. You'll never know true freedom until you become the slave of Christ. Now, if that thought interests you, you can go online and listen to the series. There are three powerful enemies that we face as children of God. The devil, the world, and the flesh. And often they come at us all at once. They don't play fair. The devil and the world come at us from without, but the flesh, our sinful fallen nature, comes at us from within. And it can be very powerful in its attempt to defeat us or to keep us defeated. In fact, we likened it to a giant that stands between us and God's will for our lives, very much like the giant Goliath stood between David and God's will for his life. In fact, if you wouldn't mind turning to 1 Samuel 17. That's the chapter that deals with the story of David fighting Goliath. Uh, as we said, the principles that come out of 1 Samuel 17 that went into David defeating Goliath are the very same principles for victory that apply to any child of God for defeating any giant in our lives. And these would include, as we said last time, giants of alcohol, drugs, pornography, homosexuality, other things like fear, anxiety, discouragement, depression, anger, all of which, in our own strength, we are no match for. When we talk about a giant standing in the way between us and God's will for our lives, you're looking at a guy who had that very testimony. I remember when I got saved, visiting my family, Cindy and I in California, and going to their church, Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa, where Pastor Chuck Smith was pastoring. And I remember sitting there listening to Chuck teach God's Word, and I loved his style. Uh, very laid back, very casual, like I was sitting in his living room having a cup of coffee, and he was just sharing with me. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, how awesome would that be to be able to teach God's Word to people? But I could never do that because I had the worst fear of public speaking you would ever imagine. When I would have to give a, a, a presentation in class as a kid, I, I, I had a full-blown anxiety attack. Heart pounding, mouth as dry as cotton. Uh, I, I, start, I couldn't talk. I was, I, it was ridiculous. And so sitting there thinking how awesome it would be to teach God's word to people, and yet knowing God could never use that with me. He could never call me to do that. And what did God call me to do? Of course, he was sitting up in heaven laughing. <laughs> wait, you, know, wait, wait till I, you see what I got planned for you. Um, but when I started ministry, my wife can tell you, uh, he didn't take it away immediately. But every week I had to get up and speak, again, I'd have an anxiety attack. And I just kept, as, as I was sitting there waiting to go up, I just kept saying, Lord, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And as I walked up to the pulpit, suddenly this calm came on me. And I was able to, you know, teach God's word. And as time went on, God began to give more and more victory. 
the giant didn't die all in one fell swoop. My giant died slowly over the course of time. Maybe your giant, uh, alcohol or drug abuse or pornography. Maybe your giant is going to die slowly too, but they will die. They will die. Because God has promised us victory. And not just a little victory. It is the birthright of every child of God to be a more than a conqueror through him who loves us. And so we have been looking, or you know, we, we were looking at 1 Samuel 17, at these principles, which I've just, in my notes, have principles for victory over giants. I'll just read them to you because, you know, we've already gone through them. They come out of 1 Samuel 17. Stay close to God. Stay close to God. Remember past victories, they will build your faith for present battles. Acknowledge your giant. Don't deny you have a giant in your life. Oh, I'm, I'm not addicted to alcohol. I just use it once in a while to calm me. Uh, I could quit smoking. I, I'm not addicted to cigarettes. I could quit smoking any time I want. All right, give me your pack of cigarettes. Let's see. Let's see. It's a giant. God will not give you victory over a giant you're not acknowledging. Number four, get angry at your giant. It's not your friend. Alcohol is not a friend that gets you through the day. Uh, cigarettes are not your friend to help you, you know, calm you down, get you through the day. They're not your friend. They're an enemy that is robbing you of your life. Get mad at your giant. Don't put your arm around and go, oh, you know, we're buddies. No. David didn't walk up to Goliath and go, come on, let's just, can't we just get along, put his arm around the guy? No, he took him out. That's what we got to do. Number five, don't let anyone discourage you from taking on your giant. As we said last Sunday, there's a lot of Christians who are not walking with God. They're carnal. And they don't want a spirit-filled Christian as a friend. Because then your life becomes a total rebuke to them. I mean, people walking in darkness don't want the light shining on them even if they're saved. And so they'll try to encourage you not to go all the way. You don't have to be a fanatic. Come on, we love Jesus. We can have a beer. We can do this and that. Yeah, but I had trouble with alcohol before I got saved. Oh, one beer isn't going to hurt you. Don't let anybody discourage you from taking on your giant. Number six, you must believe the promises of God if you're going to have victory. I was telling a woman after first service, because she was wrestling with some things. And I said, you know, when Paul said that we are to reckon the promises of God to our account, it was in a bookkeeping term. You know, it's a, you, have to, you have to put it to your account by faith. It's a faith word. So I told her, it's like if I give you a check for $1,000, but you don't think it's good, so you don't cash it. I know it's good, but you're never going to be able to use it, draw from it, uh, if you don't think it's good and cash the thing. Faith, you got to cash God's checks in a sense. His promises. Take them to the bank. Apply them to your account. It's not just for so and so and yeah, well, I know God's promises for him or for her, but not me. As long as you think that way, you will never have victory. And the last one I want to deal with today I'm just calling number seven, the battle is the Lord's. Look at verse 45. Then David said to the Philistine, You come at me with sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Verse 46, This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. Verse 47, Then all this assembly shall know, that the Lord does not save with sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Now, we've already touched on this principle, but I wanted to restate it because it's absolutely critical for victory that the battle is the Lord's. Yet you must know that. You must know that. The battle is the Lord's. This is a principle, guys, that we all must remember when it comes to victory over whatever difficulty, problem, giant we're facing. The battle belongs to the Lord, and He alone can give you victory. That's why you must 
rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. Look, he doesn't want you to try harder. You know, Lord, I promise I'm going to try harder. Guys, the f- no. I don't want you to try harder. I want you to abide longer. God doesn't want us making some lame New Year's rev- resolution about, I'm going to change, Lord. I'm going to quit smoking. I'm going to quit drinking. I'm going to stop looking at pornography and whatever. Trying to use the flesh to defeat the flesh. That never works. He wants you to get serious about your walk with him. And surrender your life to the power of the Holy Spirit because, guys, that is the only way you're going to know true and lasting victory. Turn to Romans 7. Of course, in Romans 7, Paul the Apostle talks about the classic battle every believer in Christ faces with their fallen nature in wanting to do God's will. And we can all relate. Every Christian can relate to what Paul says here in Romans 7. Let's just read. I'll pick, I'll pick a few verses out. Look at verse 19. Paul said, and I'm reading out of the NLT. Paul said, I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. I love God's law with all my heart. But there's another power within me that is at war with my mind. Now keep that in mind. We're going to come back to it in a moment. Very important concept. But there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to my fallen sin nature that is still within me. Look, I love God's word, Paul said. Who can, what Christian can't relate to this? I love God's word. I want to do everything God has told me to do. But I don't always do it. Stuff I don't want to do. I don't want to sin anymore and, get, you know, and, and so on. But sometimes I, I still do those things. Paul says there's this war inside of me. The things I want to do, I don't always do. That which I don't want to do, sometimes I do. Guys, Romans 7 is a chapter of defeat. It ends with a cry of defeat, O wretched man that I am. And yet the next chapter, Romans 8, (laughs) is a chapter of victory and ends with a cry of victory. We are more than conquerors. (laughs) You say, what happened? Did did a section fall in my Bible? I, I, I don't... What happened? Am I missing some pages? I mean, how did Paul go from miserable failure one chapter to the next chapter he's more than a conqueror how did that happen you see in chapter 7 Paul uses the personal pronoun I and me 46 times the focus of chapter 7 is self as in I'll try harder it was Paul's testimony of when he tried to defeat sin in his life through his own strength, raw determination, and hard work. And that's why, guys, it's a chapter of defeat and ends with a cry of defeat. But in chapter 8, a tremendously uplifting and victorious chapter, the key word is spirit, as in Holy Spirit. The word spirit is used 23 times in Romans chapter 8, more than any other time in any chapter of the Bible. And that's why it's a chapter of victory that ends with a cry of victory. We are more than conquerors. I'll paraphrase what comes next. Through our relationship with Christ and the indwelling Holy Spirit. Turn to 2 Peter 1. Second Peter 1, I want you to key in on verse 3. Peter said, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. His divine power. The word power, there is the Greek word dunamis, 
the same word we get the English words dynamic and dynamite from. It's the same Greek word Paul used in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, and Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Luke wrote that one. In Romans 1, verse 16, Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God at work, the dynamic, dynamic, dynamite power of God, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it reads, Jesus speaking, but you, speaking to his disciples, will receive power, dunamis, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Guys, the same power that saved us is the same power that equips us for service, and it's the same power that conforms us into the image of our Savior, Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. In other words, that power, that power gives us total victory over our sinful fallen nature and makes us all that God wants us to be. Turn to Galatians 3 and then kind of hang out in the neighborhood because we're going to be there for a little bit. You see, here's the trap that the devil gets a lot of people to fall into, a lot of Christians. They know they've been saved by God's grace through their faith. That's pretty obvious, okay? But then the devil gets them on a works trip. Having been saved by grace, they now try to be made perfect or mature or fruitful through the hard work of their flesh. This is what the Galatian churches were doing. And Paul wrote them in Galatians 3, verse 3, and said, How foolish can you be? After starting your Christian lives in the Spirit, you got saved, right? Not through hard work, but by the Spirit of God, through your faith. After starting your Christian lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect, mature, by your own human effort? Guys, the bottom line is that the Christian life is a super natural life it is not it is not a glorified self-help program a lot of churches have turned it into that the christian life is a supernatural life turn to ephesians 3 verse 20 it's one of my favorite verses ephesians 3 verse 20 Paul said, now, all glory to God, who is able. <laughs> Don't miss that. All glory to God, who is able, through his mighty power, dunamis, at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Who accomplishes all the work he wants to do in and ultimately through us? God. His power saved us. His power sanctifies us. We don't get in there at all. The only thing that we supplied towards our salvation was the sin. And once we're now saved, we dare not say, okay, God, thanks for saving me. Move over, and I'll show you what I can do now. A lot of Christians may not say it that way, but that's what they're thinking. That's how they're living. Look, the idea of God's mighty power, as Paul said in Ephesians 3.20, the idea of God's mighty power at work within us is a reference to Jesus Christ who lives within us through his indwelling Holy Spirit. In John 14, you'll have to turn there. Jesus was talking to his disciples the night before the cross, saying, I'm going away soon. Where I'm going, you can't follow me. Not yet. I'll come back for you. But I'm not going to leave you alone like orphans. I'm going to pray the Father is going to send another helper, another comforter, the Holy Spirit, right? He's going to abide with you forever. And then he makes a startling statement in chapter 14, verse 18. I will come to you. I will come to you in the person and power of the Holy Spirit. 
That's exactly the point Peter is making in 2 Peter 1, verse 3, when he says, His, as His divine power, has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. In the Greek, the His points back not to God in general, but to Jesus in particular. Uh, 2 Peter 1, 2 talks about Jesus Christ which I believe is Peter's way of saying the very thing that Paul said in Galatians 3.20. You can turn there real quick. Uh, guys, these are all scriptures you know, okay? And they're all saying basically the same thing in different words. But when Peter talks about the divine power, his divine power, Jesus' power that he has given to us, that will allow us, give us everything we need for life and godliness, Paul the Apostle, because the same spirit wrote the entire Bible, the same spirit that was working in Peter to write was working in Paul. They stated it a little differently. It's the same idea. Where Peter says his divine power gives us everything we need for life and godliness, Paul says in Galatians 3, uh, 2.20, For I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh. I live in this body. I now live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The power to live the Christian life, guys, doesn't come from a principle. It comes from a person. And his name is Jesus Christ. He won the victory on Calvary's cross. He vanquished principalities and powers, the devil and his demons, through his death and resurrection. And since we as Christians are now in him, in Christ, all the victory... All the power that we need to live our Christian lives comes through him. We just need to look to Jesus by faith to live his life through us. As Paul said, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Guys, it is faith that releases the power of God into our lives to be saved and the power we need to be all that God wants us to be and to do all the work God's called us to do. Not hard work on our part. You know, self-effort as we rely on the strength of our flesh. Trying to use the flesh to conquer the flesh. What a self-defeating proposition that is. Of course, it all starts with us receiving Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, which causes us to be born of the Spirit, born again, right? And brings us into a deep abiding relationship with Him. That's, that's how it starts. You receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, and it instantly you are connected with Christ in this vital union. You are one with Him. And that starts a process, it's called sanctification, that goes on the rest of your entire life. And is only completed when the rapture happens and you receive your new glorified body, which at that time is now perfect. Until then, we're a work in progress. Understand, though, that the knowledge Peter is referring to in 2 Peter 1.3, that knowledge that provides the power we need to live for God, isn't a superficial knowledge but a knowledge that is deeply intimate and experiential. As when a hu husband knows his wife, as the Bible says, Cain knew his wife and she bore him a son. That is a very deep, intimate, personal kind of knowledge. It's not acquaintance knowledge. It's a deep, personal knowledge. There are a lot of people who attend church. Some have even grown up in the church that have a superficial head knowledge of Jesus Christ. I mean, they know the doctrinal facts about his life, his death, his resurrection, but they have no firsthand experiential knowledge of him because, listen, they aren't connected to him through the Holy Spirit. Or in other words, they're not born again. They're churchgoers, but they're not born again churchgoers. When Peter speaks of the knowledge of Jesus that brings the power of God into our lives to live for him, he uses the Greek word epigonosko. And epigonosko is a word that speaks of a knowledge that is deep, genuine, and experiential as opposed 
to a knowledge that is superficial and theoretical. Casual knowledge. Guys, the only way a person can gain this kind of deep knowledge of spiritual truth and the wisdom it takes to apply that truth into their lives is by, first of all, receiving Jesus Christ into their heart, at which time the Holy Spirit comes in and begins to, as Jesus said in John 16, verse 13, begins to lead them into all spiritual truth. So it's a process. And the more you get to know Jesus, the more you know God's truth and the wisdom to apply that truth. The more you know God's word, the more you know Jesus. It goes hand in hand. It never ends. I don't think it's going to ever end for eternity. Us knowing God in a deeper way. Paul the Apostle was a Christian for 30 years, yet in Philippians 3, he said, I want to know him. What? Paul, you've known him for 30 years. Oh, no, no. I want to know him deeper all the time. I want to know the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to be conformed to his image. That happens every day. We can never say as Christians, I've been a Christian for 40 years, like me. I'm done growing. <laughs> I know everything I need to know. There are Christians who believe that. They don't know anything. That's not how Paul viewed it. Now, many Christians continue to be deceived into thinking that there's some information for living the Christian life that uh, they're somehow lacking in their relationship with Jesus. You know, Information not found in the Bible, some secret principle or spiritual mystery that if they only knew it, they would be instantly catapulted into spiritual victory and power. In the first century church, they were dealing with that kind of mentality because there was a group of mystics who went by the name Gnostics. Epigonosko comes from gnosko, which means knowledge in the Greek. The Gnostics believed they had knowledge that went beyond knowledge the apostles had. Knowledge that you absolutely needed. You want to know God in a really deep way? You've got to meditate the way we teach you. You've got to fast the way we show you. We have secrets of hidden knowledge that even the apostles don't have. So come with us, you know? Hang with us. We'll teach you. Gnosis. Gnostics. Peter said... He used epigonosco, which is a strong form of gnosko. They think they got knowledge. You got epigonosco knowledge. The knowledge we have is experiential. We're actually connected to Christ. We're not learning about him. He's in us. We're one with him. You can't get closer than that to God. Paul, in Colossians 2, verse 8, called that teaching, and I'm quoting him, that's high-sounding nonsense. The result of Christians not having, listen, a high view of Scripture. And a big part of that is not believing the Word of God is sufficient for all things that pertain to life and godliness. Guys, sufficiency simply means that everything we need in the way of truth to be saved and to live our lives for God, the Christian life is contained in God's Word. It doesn't need to be supplemented with any other source of knowledge or information. Everything you need to be all God wants you to be, you have in your lap. It's the Word of God. It's complete, right? When it comes to an instruction manual for victorious Christian living, the Bible is complete. It's sufficient. You don't have to turn to this. Psalm 19, verse 7, David said, The law of the Lord... The Word of God, that's what he was saying. The Word of God is perfect, converting the soul. The Hebrew word for perfect is a translation of a word that means whole, complete, sufficient. It conveys the idea of something that is comprehensive, so as to cover all, aspect, all aspects of an issue. Turn to Ephesians 4.
Verse 17, Paul said, This I say, therefore, this I say, sounds good in English. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, listen, in the futility of their mind. Here Paul is admonishing believers to stop living the old life of sin like unbelievers who do so because of the futility of their mind and to start living new lives of holiness in victory for God. Holiness and victory for God. The phrase futility of their mind actually means empty-headedness of worldly thinking. The empty-headedness of worldly thinking. Paul is telling us here in Ephesians 4 that the main difference between Christians and non-Christians, I'm just speaking on a practical level, Obviously, there's some very deep spiritual differences. But the main, di on a practical level, difference between Christians and non-Christians, listen to me, is in the way each group thinks. Once a person repents, and the word repent comes from the Greek word metanoia, which literally means to have a change of mind, a change in the way you think, once a person repents and receives Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, again, they are born of the Spirit, born again, and receive a new nature. The nature of God, Peter tells us in 2 Peter 1, verse 4. Here's the problem. We still have the old fallen nature, don't we? So now we have the old fallen nature we inherited from Adam. And now we have a new nature that the Holy Spirit gives us who now lives in our hearts, right? So you have the old nature... And the new nature, living in the same person, that creates conflict, to say the least. Actually, a war breaks out. A war breaks out. Turn to Galatians 5. Galatians 5, verse 17. Paul said the sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other so that you are not free to carry out your good intentions. Another translation, the New King James says, look, the Spirit is constantly warring against the flesh, the fallen nature. And the flesh against the spirit, these two are at constant war with each other so that you don't always do the things you want to do. So there's war, this war is going on. People say to me, Pastor, I don't think I'm saved. Why, why do you say that? Because I, I'm always struggling with sin. How can a person be saved and always struggle with sin? I think Spurgeon said it best. Dead men don't struggle. If you're struggling, you got a new nature inside there. Because let's be honest, before we got saved, we didn't struggle. We just gave into the flesh, whatever the flesh wanted. The fact that we're fighting something now inside tells us we have a new nature, right? This war breaks out. And guys, let me say this. Which nature, old or new, that will be victorious and wind up controlling our lives depends largely, listen, on how you think. On how you think. Even as Solomon said, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And that's why we are commanded as Christians to stop thinking like the world thinks. Once we get saved, stop thinking like the world. We thought, we thought like the world for all the years be, before we got saved, right? The Bible says once you're saved, stop thinking like the world. And start thinking like the redeemed children of God you are now in Christ. Romans 12, verse 2. Paul said, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world any longer, is the idea, but let God transform you into a new person, listen, by changing the way you think. Now, I was telling first service, I want you to understand that the, the truth that we are presenting this morning is very basic, and it's not very deep. It's not very profound. It's, a, it's Christianity 101. The problem is some people think because it's so basic, how can it be that important? 
Some of the most important truths in God's word are simple truths that children can comprehend. Why does it have to be deep for it to be true? And why, if it's simple, can't it be powerful? That's The devil's got to, you know. And here's the thing. I want you to see this. And I pulled out various scriptures so that you see how that the war, the war for control of your life is taking place in your head with regard to how you think. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. I just want you to understand, though, that... I can't stress enough the importance of how spiritual warfare is taking place in the mind for control of the way you think. And once you get saved, of course, that's what it was all the days before we got saved. We were brainwashed by the devil. But now God says you need to be unbrainwashed. You have to start, start thinking clearly. Ephesians 4. Verses 21 to 23. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, the gospel, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life that is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit of God renew your thoughts and your attitudes. Guys, the main way our thoughts are changed as Christians is through the study of the Word of God. It's about as basic as it gets, right? Not profound truths. Peter said, I'm going to put you in remembrance of what you already know. Because sometimes the stuff we know the best, we, we live the least. It's too simple. I learned that when I first got saved. So what? So what? How are you doing with it? You living it? Well, I don't know, but I learned it a long time ago. Great. I'm not going to help you. You don't do anything with it. The main way our thoughts are changed as Christians. You know, don't think like the world anymore. You know, because that's just going to lead to a worldly life. Get transformed in the way you think by, by, you know, conforming your mind to the Word of God, right? The Word of God is the issue. Psalm 119, verses 9 and 11. How can a young man cleanse his way? How can a young man change the way he's living? Here's the answer, by taking heed according to your word. Verse 11, your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. God's word teaches us. Maybe you never thought about it. I challenge you to check it out. God's word, God's word teaches us that godly living always flows from godly thinking. That's why there's so much in the New Testament about getting your head on right, filling your mind with God's word and so on. Godly living always flows from godly thinking, which is only possible by the renewing of your mind through the Word of God. I am absolutely convinced that the reason so many Christians are living worldly lives is because, listen now, they're still thinking worldly thoughts. And that is the number one reason the devil is able to keep them captive and under his control when the Lord Jesus promised us in John 8, verse 32, God's truth will set you free from the devil's hold. Well, why am I still in bondage then? How come I haven't experienced freedom? Jesus said it. The Bible teaches it. Well, why am I still in bondage? I don't know. I'll ask you. Are you in the Word? I was telling first service guys, I know Christians over the years who never read the word in daily devotions they don't have any daily devotions and they only open it when they come to church on sunday morning and they don't even do that regularly is it any wonder why they're still so defeated and then they feel like god's let them down god's word isn't true for them because god promised me victory i i don't have victory well yeah how much are you in the word well i don't know i'm in it once in a while are you doing anything with it? Well, I don't know, but I, I read it once in a while. Well, there's your answer, man. Why am I so skinny? Not me. Why am I so skinny and so weak all the time? I don't know. Are you eating? Oh, I, well, I eat once in a while. Uh, you know, I like to have a Twinkie here and there, but I mean, yeah. well, you're answering your own thing, man. It's not rocket science. You're skinny and frail because you're not eating right. Why are you skinny and frail as a Christian? You're not eating right. And when Christians do eat, they turn on junk food. 
some goofball on the TV. He doesn't know what he's talking about or what she's talking about, making all kinds of promises built on nothing God has really said. That's a different message. Okay. Um, guys, we wind it down. This, this is all very, very important to us as Christians because, as I said earlier, most spiritual warfare takes place in the mind for control of your thinking. Again, Romans 7, 23, there is an, I love, the, I love God's word, <laughs> Paul said. I want to do God's work. But there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to my fallen sinful nature, which is still within me. Sure it is. The sinful fallen nature is going to stay with us until we are raptured or we die. Until then, we're going to fight it constantly. Satan wants to control your thinking because it's once again, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23 verse 7 tells us. And so the devil wants to flood your mind with images and messages that are designed to keep you defeated and under his control by keeping you brainwashed in his way of thinking, which James tells us all of Satan's stuff he tries to pump into our brains is earthly, sensual, and demonic. How's he doing? You might be thinking, well, how do I know if he's really getting a hold of me? You know, how, how do I know if he's brainwashing me? And, and how effective is, is he being brainwashing me? How much do you love the world? How much do you love the world? You will know how successful the devil is being in your life. Because it will manifest itself in a love for the things of the world more than in a love for God. John talked about this. You can just write it down. I'll read it. You can look it up later. 1 John 2, verses 15 and 16. Do not love the world. Now, that's the fallen world system that Satan controls, not the planet Earth, ecology, nature. I love nature. No, we're not talking about that. Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this fallen world system. And that's why it is so imperative that we as Christians constantly be on guard as to what enters into our minds if the... If our minds are ground zero for spiritual warfare, a battle between the Holy Spirit and the devil to control the way we think because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. That we must absolutely be on guard as to what enters into our minds, but I'll tell you this, it's getting harder and harder. You see, the God of this world, the devil, has control of most of the information streams that target the mind through the eyes and ears and is using them to brainwash unsuspecting people into thinking the way he wants them to think. And guys, they don't even know it. They don't even know it. Some of these information streams would, of course, include movies, television, the Internet, music, of course, some of the more uh, gross forms, hip-hop, death metal, obviously warped the mind. I was having a little fun with Barb Z, first service, and I said, you know, I know some of you are into death metal, Bar Barb. Uh, you know, I thought I saw you at the farmer's market with the Metallica t-shirt on. Fess up, man. Oh, she's, she lost it. We had to stop the message for a few minutes. She lost, she's great. She's a good, a good uh, sport, you know. But it's not just the obvious things like that, uh, hip-hop, death metal. In my Christian news service, it had an article about Taylor Swift's new song. Uh, the song is called, You Need to Calm Down. You know who that's directed at? You folks. It was promoting homosexuality and gay rights. And all you Christians, you know, you all coming against all that. You need to calm down. That's what the world's preaching at us, right? I was telling for a service, it's a joke. 
Once in a while, here's somebody from Hollywood putting down us pastors because we're preaching from our pulpits this, our ideologies. Look, on a good week, I preach to maybe a couple hundred people. How, much, how many people do they preach from, to? From their pulpit. How many people watches their movies or listens to the music? Millions and millions. You get the audacity to say, I'm the problem? And they are preaching a message, aren't they? Everything you watch on television or you listen to is trying to preach a message, and the devil is behind it all. Some of it's worse than others, yes. They're promoting everything, these information streams, everything from sexual immorality to occultism, Eastern mysticism, yoga, transcendental meditation, so many different things. We need to be be on guard that that junk doesn't enter into our minds through our eyes and ears. Be careful what you watch and what you listen to. But it's more than that. Godly living is more than that. It's not just the absence of what's bad. It's also the presence of what's good. And quickly, we're out of time. But I'll just read these to you. Write them down. Philippians 4, verse 8. Paul said, now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Do you see the, are you catching a pattern here? I mean, Paul, Peter, the other apostles, New Testament writers, were all hammering on this idea. The devil wants to control the way you think because then he control the way you live. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. The idea is if you fill your mind with God's word, God's th thoughts, God's praise, the devil can't get in there with junk that will get you thinking a certain way and tempting you in a certain direction and getting you to fall to some godless thing. Again, if you fill your mind with God's word, you begin to think like God thinks, which means you stop thinking like the world thinks. The result, folks, will be a renewed mind and a transformed life. Even as Jesus said, cleanse the inside of the cup, it will overflow and cleanse the outside also. He wasn't talking about doing dishes, right? Uh, it starts with the heart. Receive Christ. The Spirit comes in, washes you of your sins, and now he begins to work from within you. And all these things begin to flow in your life and then out of your life. You become more and more like Christ. But listen, if you just come to church and hear the Word of God taught, but you basically let it go in one ear and out the other, without any real desire to obey it, then God's Word will do you no good. The Word of God, although living and powerful, Hebrews 4.12, will be rendered lifeless and powerless to change your life because you are not really serious about doing all that it says. Oh, you might be sitting there, well, I do some of it, you know. I, I, I read the Bible once in a while, and I, I try to do some of it. Well, Jesus said, Matthew 4, verse 4, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every word. Little obedience, little power. Little power, little change. Probably no victory. Jesus promised us, back in John 8, verses 31 and 2, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples truly, and you will know the truth, God's truth, and the truth shall make you free. But that implies that you read it every day, Believe it and hide the word in your heart every day. Because then and, only God, then and only then, guys, will it transform your life, set you free, and make you more than a conqueror. Look, the battle of David against Goliath is a tremendous study in gaining victory over seemingly invincible enemies and insurmountable problems. We have looked at that over the last three weeks. These problems, these giants come at us all the time. 
But there are some other battles. Uh, next week, I want to look at two more quickly. I'm not going to in, look at them in depth. I want to just pull out a couple of principles. from two. I love the battles of the Bible because they teach us how to wage warfare and how to be victorious. And there's two that came to my mind that I would like to just pull a couple of principles out of them uh, on the subject of how do you gain victory. And then I like to end that message <clears throat> by just warning you to be on guard. Because once you have victory, all the teaching revolves around pretty much gaining victory, right? What about when you have the victory? You don't hear much about that, right? Folks, sometimes holding on to the victory you have won is harder than gaining it in the first place. And there are some things that we can look at. So may God give grace as we finish next week. I'm making no promises. <laughs> Probably we'll finish next week looking at true freedom. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. It is truth and it is power. And we pray, Lord, you give us grace to walk in all of it, to live according to everything you have spoken. And that, Lord, you'll just give victory to us as we seek to honor you walk with you, and claim the victory that Christ has already won for us on Calvary's cross. Give us grace, Lord, that we might be children who are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Father, we ask you to continue to bless the study in your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Remember, Amen. you are children of God. The devil, he's a defeated enemy. He makes a lot of noise. He's a toothless tiger. Don't be afraid of him. You cling to your Savior. He'll give you victory. I don't know what you're going through. I guarantee you he will give you victory because he's already won the victory on Calvary's cross. Amen. Have a great week. God bless you guys.